So what's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of The Adapted Lens. As always, I'm your host, Jason Giralo. Super happy to have you with us on this Wednesday evening. It is Wednesday, right? I know with everybody being locked down, it is kind of hard to know what day it is these days. Uh, but <clears throat> excuse me, with all of the talk these days about being stuck at home for photographers, obviously, if, especially if you shoot wildlife like I do, that makes uh, kind of a big challenge because... Well, all the parks are closed, all the trails are closed, so where do you go, what do you do, how do you shoot? And I've been seeing a lot of content lately, and it's really great content about uh, staying at home and shooting at home, uh, which is a great thing to do, um, but with all this spare time that you have, maybe something that you should be doing instead uh, is something that's probably been maybe a little bit neglected, I know with me at least, is somewhat neglected, and that is dealing with storage and backup <clears throat> so today I wanted to talk a little bit about exactly what I do, um, and maybe this will help you all uh, with uh, storage situations or, or trying to figure out exactly what uh, storage would be best for you, especially if you're just starting out, uh, because the earlier you start doing this, the easier it's going to be in the long run, because it certainly gets more complicated the more photos you have Um I have over 100,000 images in my catalog, and so anytime I decide to change something, it's 100,000 images i got to work with, which really does add up, and it takes just ex ex extra time because everything that you do with a big file system just takes extra time. So if you can catch this early and start it out right, your likelihood of uh, agony is reduced, and, and I think that's uh, certainly a valuable thing. So while you're stuck at home, maybe consider uh, not just creating more photos, but taking some time uh, to uh, review your storage system, make sure you're doing things the right way, make sure you're using uh, backups properly, and um, so with that, we'll start out. So I think probably for most people, and I know this is how I started, um, I started with taking pictures, sticking them in folders, and putting them on my internal hard drive. Um, I started photography back in the day enough when, back in the day, uh, that uh, it was easy enough to stick, you know, smaller files onto the onto your local hard drive. Back then, they were spinning hard drives, so they were typically larger, 500 gigs, a terabyte, something like that, in a in a desktop or laptop, and, and sometimes in a desktop, multiple spinning hard drives. Um, for me, that worked for a really long time, and so basically my photo organization style initially going out of the gate was dump it off my SD card, put it on a local hard drive, name it by the location and the year. And so that's probably pretty similar to what most of you all do. Um, I thought it was pretty easy to organize that way. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about, okay, well, this was shot here at this year, so say uh, this was shot at... Uh, Niagara Falls in 2017 or something like that. So it would be 2017 space Niagara Falls. The problem in lies, um, if you're not super uh, careful, especially as the years go on, you may start running into issues where you go back to the same location multiple times. And so uh, say you went, say Niagara Falls was in your backyard and you went every year, multiple times a year. Well, after a while, you don't remember which picture was taken during which year and so it gets it all just runs together was that taken in 2016 or 2017 or was that picture taken in 2018 and so if you go a lot and you shoot a lot you end up really having a hard time finding your way and so about uh, three or so years into photography I actually decided to get rid of the year system altogether and I know you can look back at metadata and find the years that way but instead I basically just lumped everything into locations and then subsorted it by categories so for example um, all of my wildlife photography is under a category under a folder called wildlife photography and then below that I have locations based on what uh, places I went to shoot, so say Merritt Island and uh, the alligator farm, etc., etc., etc. I also know some photographers who, instead of doing it by uh, location, do it by species. If you want to get really crazy, that's a good way to do it, but uh, this way you have all of your black crowned night heron photos in one location and all of your great egret photos in another location. It, it's it's uh, if you're really uh, super fanatical, that may be a good way to do it for you. But for me, I found that just by, uh, you know, overall category, wildlife, people, family, pets, whatever, something like that. And then locations, uh, I, I find that helps and that works best. If you're a wedding photographer or someone who does weddings and photo shoots, I also find that uh, doing that works fairly well. 
Uh, what I do with those is I have a category called people and then each project has its own individual title. So people and then so-and-so's wedding or so-and-so's engagement portrait uh, uh, session. So that's just an idea for that. So once you go past uh, internal storage, which I'm assuming most people today have a modern computer, which you're going to have a smaller solid state drive. So you're going to quickly need to move to external storage. So just a couple of examples. <clears throat> this is a let hard drive. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, this is just a standard platter drive. And by platter drive, I mean it's got an actual, it's like a record. If you uh, don't know how a hard drive works, think of it basically like a spinning record uh, where a magnetic needle reads the information. That's the easiest way I can explain it to you all. Um, these are great because they're cheap and they're big. Um, you know, a terabyte is 50 bucks or something like that. It's easy to carry. Um, they're small. This is a Lassie, so it's a durable hard drive. This is pretty tough. Uh, as you can see, there's, I don't know if you can see if this actually focuses. I don't know. You can see it's pretty scuffed up and scraped up. It's lived in my camera bag. It's lived in suitcases and things like that. It's a decent drive. It cost me, you know, 50 or 60 bucks, or that one might've cost me a little bit more than that because of the tough, quote unquote, tough drive. Um, these are typically either USB 2.0 or USB 3.0. Uh, the problem with these drives is, uh, and I'll get to a better solution here in a second, but the problem with these drives is uh, the RPMs. They're 5,400 RPM uh, typically, and so that means that the drive only spins at 5,400 revolutions per minute, which sounds fast, but in the grand scheme of things, in data, uh, data reading times or data writing times, it's actually really slow. Um, so better to have something like a 7200 or 10,000 rpm hard drive problem is not many of these i'm not even sure if any of these just plug and play usb drives come in 7200 or 10,000 rpm uh, to be honest i haven't been keeping up with this technology because i've moved on to some other things that i think are actually a lot better uh, so the second option is this these are just desktop versions of the other drive that I was just showing. Uh, this is a Western Digital, but a whole bunch of different companies make them. They are also cheap. They're also fairly reliable. Um, the big news there is that they get their power from a wall socket. Uh, and so they have tend to have faster hard drives. They're using uh, 3.5 instead of 2.5 inch hard drives. So they're bigger hard drives, a little more beefy. Um, and they run typically at 7,200 or, or 10,000 RPM, which is going to give you better read and write speeds. And especially if you're a modern day photographer shooting 24, 36, 42, 46, more 61, I think Sony has megapixels, that read write speed is going to be a huge key. And beyond that, also thinking about uh, moving away from USB 2.0, definitely to 3.0, at least as like the bare minimum, but even better than that would be like USB-C, which is, I think now USB 3.2. I think is the new way they're doing it, but the USB-C drive that sort of uh, a whole heck of a lot faster um, and, and is gonna give you a better uh, throughput, which is gonna make your life uh, a lot happier. And so I still keep my Lightroom catalog on my computer. It's locally stored, um, but it's small because it's just the catalog part. It's just essentially a database uh, with all the previews and stuff all in one little package. It's fairly small, I would say it's not small, but it's fairly small. And then I keep the photos themselves on an external hard drive. And so that's a good option, but what I really like are these things. This is a SanDisk. They're made by, again, a number of different companies. Uh, SanDisk makes pretty good ones. Um, there's just a lot of them. Those are solid state drives. And so this guy, little guy right here is two terabytes. Uh, and this much larger guy is also two terabytes. Uh, so it's pretty amazing how small this is. It also has no moving parts. So it's in inf infinitely more rugged than uh, just a sim simple hard drive. Uh, the downside, of course, is that it is also infinitely more expensive. Uh, two terabyte solid state drive is, you know, in the hundreds of dollars instead of, you know, 50 or 100 bucks. Um, but with that, you get USB-C, which is a much faster throughput. And you get almost internal hard drive speeds read-write. So it's not quite as good as if it were kept on your hard drive locally. But it's pretty close. And uh, for photography, you're going to notice a huge speed improvement by moving your photos off of a platter drive and onto a solid state drive. It's definitely worth the investment. 
With that, also talk a little bit about backups. So are you backing up your photos? Because I know for a long time I wasn't. And yes, oh, shame on me. Uh, it was very bad, naughty, naughty Jason, for not backing up my photos. Um, so <clears throat> these hard drives, USB hard drives, have a pretty low failure rate. Um, they're fairly strong, fairly durable, fairly unlikely to fail. But the first time it does and you lose all your photos, you're going to really regret not having a backup plan. And so I don't, I don't want to go into super detail on this because you can get totally out of control with you know how you do your backups and what methodology you use. If you use an Apple product, you can use Time Machine, which works great. It's just sort of plug and play. It's automatic. Um, but really the key here is to have a backup. So for me, this is one and this is two. They're identical. That's that's my my main one and my backup. So it's nice to have an easy, simple solution. Everything that's on the first drive is on the second drive. Everything that's on the second drive gets updated every time I plug it in. Uh, so it's a real simple, 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 simple. And that's the key, because if it's simple, you do it. If you start getting complicated and running all sorts of software or trying to do you know specific update patterns and blah, 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 it just gets to be too much work and you end up not doing it. And that's the killer. So simple is great. Another thing that I do, and I'm not, I don't have it here because it's connected to my network, um, but I have a network drive. I have a NAS drive. It's made by Synology. Um, if you've never set up a network drive, it is not nearly as scary as you think. Um, today's network drives are just a breeze compared to something, say, five or six years ago that was much more complicated to connect. So for that drive, I have two six terabyte 7200 RPM drives in a RAID configuration so that they're backed up to each other. Um, and then that's connected to my network. So every time I boot up my computer, that drive connects to my computer. And if I have made changes, it automatically refreshes and moves files over to that drive as a third backup. So that's my network backup. But it goes even further than that. Now, I don't go quite as far as some folks. I think there are some people that actually keep an off-site storage as well. I think if I were probably shooting more commercial work or more work for people who I could not recreate that photo. So if I was a wedding photographer um, full time, I would probably suggest having an offsite backup as well, like a physical, like buy one of these, plug it into your computer and then take it to a safety deposit box so that if your house burns down, you still have all your photos. Uh, I don't go that far. I, I kind of hope that something like that would never happen. Um, I know it's probably not the best thing in the world, but one of the things that I do think is a good idea is to make sure whatever you have that's a non-connected drive, so like this drive doesn't stay connected to my computer all the time. Uh, so I plug it in, I do my backup, I unplug it, and I stick it in, in my little bin over there. And the reason I think it's important to not leave it connected all the time is because you can get a virus that could lock your files, and then your backup has also been locked. So my network drive would get affected by that, but a physically disconnected USB hard drive wouldn't. Uh, and so having that USB disconnected from the computer uh, protects you in case you have a, a virus incursion or something like that where both your normal working drive and even your network backup drive can get corrupted. Your local but disconnected from everything uh, drive would be safe. And so that's a really great thing that you can do. Uh, it just works perfectly and as long as you don't drive it over with a car or something like that, it, it's going to be fairly stable. Um, Another thing that you should consider is cloud storage. Um, I do. Uh, I think it's really great, especially today. Now, the big si downside to cloud storage is getting it there. Um, if you don't have super fast internet, it's going to take you days, weeks, months, years to upload all of your files to the cloud. That's why I said, you know, the sooner you get into doing this, the less painful it's going to be because moving 100,000 photos to the cloud is going to take me forever. And it has. I'm it takes a long time. Um, but if you've only taken, you know, 300 photos and it's your first day out with a camera, connecting to a cloud storage site is not going to be a big deal and it's going to be done in a few hours. And then as long as you keep up with it, you'll always have a fresh, a fresh set of photos up in the cloud that are nice and safe and secure. And I, I think that that's probably the sort of the last line of defense. Now, I think you could probably get away with having on-site storage for your working and then just a cloud backup. The problem in there lies that it's not so much that the cloud storage would fail. It's really more about time down. So if your computer crashes and you need 100,000 photos and you need to get those because you have clients that need them, 
waiting for a file to download is just going to take forever. And you, some of these services offer you shipped hard drives, so they'll ship you a drive with all your files on it, stuff like that. But having that local, so you can just say, this one's dead, plug in, and you got a new one going to good. And then you can replace the one that you've been using as a backup as the, the new active one and replace the backup. In other words, you can just rotate out and get rid of the one that died. Um, I think it's definitely going to be more efficient. Uh, so yeah, you're not down for days or weeks while you're waiting for photos to download. But there are some really cool options uh, for cloud storage that are really, really cheap or even free. So um, if you've not do, done anything else, if you don't do any other backups, consider doing at the very bare minimum at least one of these two things. So first off, if you have Amazon Prime, and I think probably just about everybody today does, you get free photo storage. It's unlimited, and it's raw files. So if you have Amazon Prime and you're spending whatever, a hundred and something dollars a year, you can stick all your full files into the cloud as raws, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. I think it's a no-brainer for just about everybody that has Amazon Prime. Another option, excuse me, another option is if you have uh, Google, Google has uh, Google Photos, and yeah, there's some pretty drastic limitations. I think you can only upload a JPEG, and it can only be at 16 megapixels, so if you shoot 30 or 60 or whatever megapixels, it's going to be down res to 16, so that's a pretty big penalty, but it doesn't cost anything at all, ever. And so if you're not doing anything, that's a decent uh, option. You know, I mean, if you're if you have no other backups and you're just sort of hanging it out there in the wind, at least with Google Photos, you're getting something back. You actually won't lose a memory, which I think is key. So I'm going to hop over before I get over to uh, some other cloud storage and chat a little bit. I have a few people up here talking to me in the chat to this guy. All right, let's see here. So, do they fail? My external drive started to fail recently. Luckily, I saved most of my data, but I think some of it's lost. I think I'll need to get a second backup drive. So, uh, yeah, they do fail. Um, unfortunately, that's, you know, downside of today's world is that drives do fail. Uh, I've had a few drives fail on me. Um, you know, the, the good news is that if you do this backup stuff, then it really won't be quite such a big penalty. Um, and especially, like I mentioned, uh, if you're doing multiple backups, then you, you pay for it up front because you have to buy extra drives. Uh, but then if they fail, you already have, you know, one to take its place. Um, how much storage do you get with these free services? So both Amazon Prime and Google Photos, for photos, it's unlimited. So that's pretty kick butt uh, for totally free. You know, well, Prime is not free because you have to pay for front per Prime, but if you're using Amazon Prime already, it's free. And then Google Photos also free again with the penalty that five giga uh, five megapixels or sixteen megapixels, excuse me, sixteen megapixels is the max file size. So that's kind of a bummer, um, but it is uh, still better than absolutely nothing, which I think is. The key there is at least you'd have something, you know, if, if you are not a professional photographer, you're not shooting weddings or events or things that you can never get back, at least you'd have a memory. That's that's a good thing. Um, if you're a professional, I, I actually don't suggest either Amazon Prime or uh, Google Photos. I think uh, the best solution for you is Backblaze. It's also ex extremely cheap. I think it's something like five bucks a month. I haven't looked recently, uh, but it is, uh, it's called backblaze.com. Uh, it's pretty much become the industry standard for just about all photographers that I know if you're backing up and not using either Amazon or, or Google Photos. Uh, Backblaze is fast, it's efficient. Um, the downside is if you store most of your photos on a network connected drive and not on a local drive only. So if you don't use one of these and instead store all your photos on your network, it doesn't cover that back. Backup. But if you carry, if you're storing your photos like most people on an external hard drive, it does no problem. And I think that they do offer a data recovery service. Um, for non-photo storage, um, I'm about to get to that. So I think that the options for non-photo storage, uh, Amazon Prime, you can actually pay for additional storage there. So you can store things that are not photos in the Amazon Prime cloud, uh, which I think is a fairly decent price. Um, but there's also... Um, 
of course, Dropbox, which is probably what everybody uses. Um, Google Drive, uh, their storage facilities are pretty uh, inexpensive as well. So if you're storing things like videos um, or music files, uh, Catalano, I know that's probably your, your case. Um, Phil, that's uh, probably going to be your best bet is going to be uh, Google Drive um, or Dropbox. Um, and then you can get into some, uh, you know, enterprise level things like Glacier and stuff like that, which I don't really think is going to be for photographers. Um, it's very, uh, well, it's not super pricey, but it's really more made for a long-term sort of thing, glacier storage. Um, if I were you and, and, and you're just starting out and you don't have a backup system at all and you don't have Amazon prime and you don't like Google, uh, Backblaze is inexpensive and it's a storage only platform. So don't think of this as a read, write situation. You don't go to Backblaze to, look at pictures or to browse your file library it's stored there and you can get it back but it's not ever accessible like as if it were just a file folder uh, for, for that you would want something more like a dropbox or a google drive and i do know some photographers that actually keep their photos permanently in the cloud and don't um, have any local storage whatsoever they use those instead and some uh, photo editing programs can actually be pointed to cloud services um, I believe that uh, uh, I think Alien Skin might be able to, um, and a few others I think can be pointed to cloud services only. So instead of having a local drive at all, you are storing everything in the cloud, uh, which is an interesting way to go. So with that, uh, any more questions in the chat, I'm going to pop that down and uh, give away my last tip. And this is, uh, I think, going to be uh, for about 95% of the photographers out there who are taking photos, who are just starting out, don't have a huge library, who don't need a ton of post-processing power. In other words, you're not spending a lot of time in Photoshop. You're not using a ton of plugins. Uh, if you're not doing those things, you really need to consider using Lightroom CC. Now, I will show you the difference. So this little bugger right here, Lightroom Classic, you all see that? It's a big square box. Well, right next to it, it's called Adobe Lightroom. It was once called Lightroom CC, then they changed it, now it's just Lightroom. Uh, the easy way to tell the difference is this one's square and this one's round, this one's got sharp cut corners, this one's got rounded corners. Um, I believe that Lightroom CC or Adobe Lightroom or however you want to refer to it is actually probably the future of photography. I think fast forward five years from now, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of people storing things on local on local storage. The internet has just become where people stick things because cloud storage is inexpensive, it's uber durable, and most importantly, you don't have to think about backups ever. So if you're a photographer, you're just starting out, consider spending money on Lightroom, Adobe Lightroom CC, or however they brand it now. Um, they have a couple different plans. Uh, $10 a month, uh, I believe, is the cheapest plan for that, and you get a terabyte of storage. You don't get Photoshop with that. You just get Lightroom only. It does just about everything that most people need to do, you know, highlights, shadows, sharpening, all that fun stuff in Lightroom CC. I won't do a deep dive into that. I will do that another day. Uh, but if you're just starting out, and you don't know exactly uh, how much this is going to take you or how far photography is going to go with you or if you're going to be taking hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of photos, um, I think uh, Lightroom CC and paying for the cloud storage just is its a great insurance platform, to be honest. I mean, all your photos get uploaded to the cloud. You can access them on any device even a web browser. So you can go to your grandmother's house and go to www.lightroom.adobe.com or something like that, or lightroom.adobe.com, I think is the website address, and log in with your credentials in Adobe, and all your photos from everywhere you've ever taken, including the Lightroom photos you take on your phone, are in that one location. So Lightroom's uh, cloud service takes care of the entire backup for you. So you don't have to worry about having an external hard drive and your hard drive failing. And uh, did you use your NAS and did you run a backup and all these other things? Uh, if you just simply use Lightroom CC as your photo management program and your storage program, it solves all those problems. Now, I did this for a long time. Uh, the downside. So, yeah, there's a downside. Storage. Storage. Um, 
if you shoot a ton of photos or have a big library already, say I have about a 2.5 terabyte uh, storage requirement for my hard for my photos. So um, Adobe sells it in blocks of a terabyte. So it's one terabyte, two terabytes, three terabytes, etc. And it's ten dollars a terabyte. So if you have anything less than ten dollar uh, ten than one terabyte, a terabyte's included with your ten dollar a month subscription. It's not so bad. If you have two terabytes, your subscription cost goes to twenty dollars a month. If you have three terabytes, your subscription cost goes to thirty dollars a month, and so on. That's not so bad until you need the entire Adobe suite like I do. So I already pay, you know, 50 bucks a month or whatever it is for Adobe to tack on the additional storage for uh, for Lightroom CC uh, does get pretty expensive. Now you're getting close to $100 a month. And so that would be the only thing that I would say is probably not uh, the best use case. So if you're someone who's a power user, uh, someone who spends a lot of time in Photoshop, which is me, I do graphic design and, and stuff like that. So I need Photoshop and Illustrator and things like that. Um, so if you're not doing that, man, save yourself a boatload of work, save yourself a lot of stress and, and just use Lightroom. Uh, again, you will be locked into the Adobe platform, but I've done a ton of research and I'm actually going to be putting together a video here about all of the alternatives to Lightroom that I've tried, and I've tried, I think, just about everyone on the market, uh, at least ones available for Mac, and why I still come back to Adobe. So uh, if you wanna see that video, uh, stick around, subscribe, like, share, and I will be putting that video up here uh, shortly. I'll probably be doing another live for that. Uh, but in the meantime, yeah, consider going with uh, Adobe Lightroom CC. I know you'll be locked in uh, to Adobe's product, uh, which, I know some people have a, a strong feelings about Adobe. Um, I used to think of myself as an Adobe fanboy. Uh, I don't anymore, but I do think that they make a great product. Uh, so uh, something to consider deeply, especially if you're just starting out. And yes, you can get all your raw files back if you decide to leave. You can download them all onto an external hard drive or whatever you want to do. I actually had to do this at one point because I was all in the cloud and then needed to expand my subscription and didn't want to pay more money. So I downloaded everything. Uh, so you can do it. It's not a big deal. Uh, it does take some time, but it's not the end of the world if you have to do it once. But again, I, I think in the alternative of losing everything or if backups or you know, constant backups are too much work, the alternative of losing all of your stuff is just devastating. So with that, I hope this was helpful. Uh, thank you again for tuning in. Uh, my name is Jason and this is The Adapted Lens. Please remember to like, share, hit that subscribe button, and don't forget to ring the bell so that you get notified every time I have another great video.